Lord God, again, again, what a joy it is to be in your house and to worship you, to be in the presence of our brothers and sisters in Christ, but Lord, more importantly, to be in you, to be in your presence, Lord God, to celebrate, to be refreshed and touched by you. Lord, on this special day, on this rally day, I spirit today for an extra measure of your spirit to indwell in me that Lord these words that are about to come from my mouth and this meditation that came from my heart Lord God that Lord that you would use it to touch your lives of your people whether in person or through the technology Lord I pray that your word may go out and it would not return to you empty just as you have promised us I ask all this, Lord, for you are a rock, and you are a true redeemer. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our eternal Savior, Jesus the Christ. My friends, I thought I would start off with a question this morning. And that question to you is, of those of you who have smartphones, we'll put air smart in air quotes there. Of those of you who have smartphones, um, who here ha who takes pictures with them? Anybody? For those of you who take pictures with your phone, how many of you would say that you have 100 pictures on your phone? How many would you say that you have 200 pictures on your phone? How many of you say that you've got 300 pictures? How many would you say 500? Who here has no more space on their phone because it's filled up with pictures? <laughs> you know, uh, we, we laugh because we all do it. Well, most of us do. We take, love to take pictures of things. Some of us even like to take pictures of our food to show people on things like Instagram. But I remember the love of taking pictures. My mother back in the day with her old click camera with the rotating flash, some of you may remember those, uh, she would always take she created a photo album every year uh, with, her, with her camera. And she would do that. She would take those pictures because she wanted to go back to those old memories, to remember the sweetness of experiencing those. She wanted to be, to be a reminder, but also not only a reminder, but to pass it along. In fact, my brother and I respectively, with our then fiancés, now wives, when we would bring them home for the first time, usually mom would break out the photo album and point out those especially embarrassing pictures. There's one she loved of me in my diaper in, after I got done playing in a mud hill. Uh, but they are a beautiful thing, and yet as we look, if we read the book of Deuteronomy, we read the book of Deuteronomy as we heard Dan read to us a little bit ago. Deuteronomy is from the Old Testament. And in Deuteronomy, you hear God telling his people to set up reminders. Reminders not necessarily just to remember him, not necessarily to set up idols or statues, but that the people would have little displays on their person and in their homes to help them remember the sweetness of God's law or his guidance over them. And he did this so that when they would see that thing, whatever it would be, or hear those words, it would call to memory to help them remember what God has done for them and what he had said to them as well as what God continues to do for them. And so where we are in Deuteronomy today, Deuteronomy chapter 6, Moses, he is getting towards the end of his life. And he, he is sharing with all the people all the treasure of God's word with all the people who were there because those people who are now there had either been very young children when God first gave the law on Mount Sinai or they hadn't even been born yet. And so God, want, God wants to make sure that they are having this word passed on and, then, and that they want to make sure that they would have that these, these uh, new people, or this new generation, they now need to hear and to experience God's law. And so we have this, the book of Deuteronomy, which simply, it simply translates as this, as the second giving of the law. And this is a big deal. This is a big deal because we each need to have it. Moses wants to pass this along so that this new generation doesn't forget what God has done for each of them. Much in the way we do it in church every Sunday, much in the way it's Sunday school or in our day school, we pass along 
we pass them along through personal stories, through testimonies. And testimonies can be a good thing. Most of you haven't heard me give my testimony because really to give it just, it takes 30 to 45 minutes. I bet you're not surprised at that. But many of you have shared yours with me. And I, Diane, I'm going to pick on you again. I still remember when we were doing, we were talking about giving my first year here and you got up and you talked about your father. Every time he would get a pay, his paycheck, he would take the top portion of it immediately before they paid any bills or they went and bought any food. They would always take that top portion off. That was a testimony that has impacted my life. He says testimonies have a way of impacting God's people. You know, I've heard it said once by this one pastor that we've all had an exodus. Each of us in the church have had an exodus where God has freed us from our slavery to sin. But each of us, come on, magic stick, it does not like me. Can somebody click for me, please? Come on. Do I need somebody else's magic stick? Okay, it's not like, that's okay, we don't, we'll go on anyway. Each of, us need, each of us has had an exodus, but each of us, we need a Deuteronomy. We need to have God's law passed along to us. Now again, Deuteronomy 6. It's just Moses retelling the law. And we didn't have verses 1 through 3. I'm just going to read them real quick for you. Moses says, Now this, com- this, this is the commandment that the statutes and the rules and the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land that which you're going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God and you and your son and your son's son by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord The God of your fathers has promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey. He's talking about the the Israel, where all these people are going on to. And Jesus Jesus is saying that they might need to pass along God's word to them. The sweetness of God's word that it may stay with them. And then we'll see if the magic stick works. We hear, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And these are powerful words. In fact, in the Jewish culture, they say these words every single day. In fact, they've got a word for it. They call it the great Shema. Everybody say Shema. Shema. The power of a microphone. It's, go, it's, it's a great word. This, this Shema is, is a huge thing for everybody. It's a huge thing for the Jewish church, because if you remember in the Jewish culture, in those days, they were living in a culture that was filled with idols. They were filled with idols, and so people were worshiping all sorts of gods. They would, so, and so they would say, the practicing Jews, the Orthodox Jew, that when they recite this thing every day, when they say, Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohino Adonai Echad, when they say these words, they were remembering of their God who is one. We need to remember that too today. We may not have gods like they had back then, but we have our versions too, don't we? Our money, our phones, our car, our home, our lifestyle. We have our own gods too, and we need to remember these words. Shema Yisrael, Adonai, Elohino, Adonai, Echad. It's not a quiz afterwards. But we need to remember the Lord, our God, is one. And then we go on to the next verse. And we hear that you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all your soul and with all of your might. You may say, these words sound familiar. I've heard them somewhere else in the Bible. And if you said that, you're right. We hear those in the gospel. We we, we, when this one guy, this hot, this hot shot lawyer comes up to Jesus, he says, Jesus, tell me what is the number one commandment? Jesus says, this is it. You shall love the Lord with all your God, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and all your might, with your very essence. I want to try something again. Look at your neighbor. Point your finger at them and say, you shall love me. 
<laughs> I heard somebody over here say they like that. <laughs> Did that make anybody feel awkward to say that, though? In our, I say that because in our American culture, feelings are king. And so we think that love is all about a feeling, right? That I feel love for somebody. In fact, if you pick up one of the rags at the grocery talking about the newest divorce in Hollywood, it's always somebody in there saying, oh, well, my feelings changed. We fell out of love. We just don't feel the same way for people, for each other again. It's not that we hate each other. We just don't have that type of feelings anymore. problem is people who say that were never committed to the other person you know when people come to me when couples come to me and they're talking about getting married and they want some advice the first thing I tell them is are you committed to that person first and foremost are you two committed to one another because if you are not committed to that person then, you, then, then that relation was doomed before it ever began. Because if your relation is based on a feeling, it's not going to happen. But the truth is that you can love somebody as a command. See, we're talking about a noun versus a fer- verb, a thing versus an action. See, if, you lo- if love is a noun... Again, it is a thing, and if it is a thing, it makes no sense in this, in, this, in this way of looking at it. But if love is an action, it makes perfect sense as a command. And dare I say, I've seen people hear love when they definitely weren't feeling it. Teachers, you know that feeling. You know when you've got a child who is having a meltdown that you still have to love that child. Michael and Kaylee, when Ethan has been up all night crying and then you've had a total of five hours sleep in five days. And trust me, parents here all know that feeling. You still love Ethan, don't you? Even when you're not feeling it, you love. And we all can love somebody regardless of whether we are feeling it at the time. And we do this regardless of our feelings because, well, God has created you for something better, hasn't he? God created you to love. Not as the world sees love, but as the way God created love to be. Regardless of how you are feeling, you can still act out that love. You can decide to show other people love. And then it can be a command that you obey we obey it because he first loved us from that cross where he went and gave up his life for you in the ultimate act of love and the third day rose from the dead defeating sin death and the devil so whoever puts their faith in him would not perish but have eternal life and yet again Jesus he quotes this passage I'm pointing up there I know it's back there too um, but Jesus he quotes this passage to us that you shall, shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might, and yet he also goes a little bit further. You might remember what the second part he says is the greatest commandment? You shall love the neighbor as yourself. The second greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You know, I was reading a book recently that was quoting this passage and they talk about how there is there was this idea of of us loving other people of loving god the european way of looking at versus the african way of doing they said the 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 compared it to hunting he said in europe they look at hunting as having a rifle looking down the sights and pulling a trigger all the energy it takes is a little pull of a finger my notes are falling away the African way is a little bit different, though. The African way, they look at it as a lion hunting. 
And the lion doesn't use his, just his paw. The lion, when he hunts, uses his very body, the entirety of his body, down even to the sinews between the joints. Jesus says, you shall love your God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And in Jesus he tells us as well as Moses tells us today that these are commandments. He tells us that this four little letter word, this verb is both a commandment and that we need to do and that each of us needs to make and we need to also pass it along to other people, the sweetness of God's words. And we go on. We hear, and these words that I command you today shall be on your hearts and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and you, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. Who are we being told that we need to teach these things to? To the children, to the next generation. And truth be told, we are all, though, children of God, aren't we? These are things we need to pass along to the next generation. Much as the way the school, the Sunday school, and hopefully parents, each of you, are doing too. In fact, parents, you first and foremost are on the front lines. You are the first and foremost the ones who should be teaching this how to be a, God, a child, how to live in a God-pleasing manner. Again, Sunday school teachers and day school teachers, you too have been teaching this command. And even though you may not even think of it sometimes that you're teaching, you are teaching how to love. You are having an impact upon this next generation. I'll share two personal stories. My son Samuel, who now is in his first year of kindergarten, but he went here to do his preschool program. He also comes to Sunday school. Uh, Samuel, often when, he, when we were done with either church or when, we're, when I was driving him home from school or when we get home, Liz and I, my wife, we would we'd ask him, so what did you learn today? How was your day? And usually, and, and probably gets this from his dad, his response would say, I don't know. <laughs> and yet later on, randomly, he would just start talking about his lessons. The lessons he had learned or if he had a question, he would just randomly start talking about it. And the other thing, another story I promised to pass you along is that in our household, we believe it's important to pray. And in fact, we pray before meals as well, regardless of whether it's in our home or out at a restaurant, and we believe it's important to pray. Except Samuel will not let Daddy freestyle it. Samuel insists that we pray the prayer that he was taught in preschool. God our Father, God our Father, we love you. Wait, am I saying it right? We love you. We know that you love us. We know that you love us. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Some of you teachers may know this song. And when we do these things, when we pass on these things to the next generation, we are having an impact when we are passing along our faith, when we're passing along our testimonies, when we are showing children how to love, we are passing along on God's work, even when you don't realize it. And yet as we look at these words, when is a good time to talk about these things? Always. When you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise, let God open the door and teach you and show you when is a good th thing, when is a good time to talk to these children. When you have a child with you, put also parents, put down the phone. Put down the phone and be in the presence, not just physically, but also mentally, emotionally, spiritually. One Sunday recently, Liz and I had gone taken the boys out to to lunch after church. At one point, I looked at the table next to us. There was a family, you could tell they were from church, they all had on their Sunday best. 
And as I looked over, I saw something odd. Three phones were out, and everybody was on them. Not a single person talking or engaging with the person next to them. None of them were actually present in the moment. You know, as I was writing down this message today, it suddenly occurred to me that it would be interesting to track with some of these people how much time people spend on their phones versus with their families. I think a lot of us are gu- entirely too guilty of spending more time on the phone than being with our families. You know, often when I'm sending out an email to parents with confirmation, I, a lot of times I will add this passage from Proverbs. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. A lot of times we read this as the kind of, let's break out the hickory stick and discipline the child. And yet if you get into a little bit of nerdiness of it, it actually is talking about the sweetness of God's word. It's talking about passing law and the sweetness of it. In fact, in the Jewish Hasidic communities, they, have, they take this passage of the sweetness quite literally. In year three, the kids come together and they recite, they learn to recite the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, Beth, Gimel, and Aleph, etc., etc. And after a child says each letter, they're given a piece of candy where the child learns the sweetness of God's word and the candy reinforcing the sweetness of God's word. And that's the thing, isn't it? That there is a sweetness to knowing the love of God. There is, excuse me, there is a sweetness to knowing that all-encompassing love of God. There is a sweetness to knowing the selfless agape love that Jesus has for you. There is a sweetness to knowing the depth of his love for you. And when you really grasp the fact that Jesus loves you so much that, uh, that he would say that I love you so much, I am willing to give up my life for yours on a cross where I took my sin upon your sin upon myself on that tree to give up my life for you so that whoever would whoever perishes and puts their faith in God first and foremost would not die but would have eternal life in him. There was a sweetness in knowing the fact that God did that for you. There is a sweetness in knowing that if you come to him and ask him to forgive your sins, that he's not going to scold you. There is a sweetness in knowing that he simply looks at you and says, Come here. We're not going to talk about this anymore because I've forgiven you. I have washed away your sins. I've got this. I love you. And you are forgiven. There is a sweetness in knowing the depths of the love of our God who cares for you. I want to close with these last two verses here. Deuteronomy 6, chapter chapter 6, verses 8 and 9, where we hear, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. You know, up north in, in the New York, New Jersey area where I grew up, you have a lot of Jewish community, a lot of Jewish communities, Orthodox Jewish communities, and you you see this there. Well, not only with with uh, with the, uh, the the mezuzah which they post on their door frames, which which traditionally contains a portion of Deuteronomy that we just covered, but the men will also take these little things we call them phylacteries. They're little tiny boxes that contain the word of God on these tiny scrolls, and they'll wrap it decoratively with a leather strap around their arms. And then they'll also put one of those phylacteries and bind it to their forehead right in the front. And they do this at its very core. The idea is to keep God and his word before you at all times. We have our own versions of this. Some of us might say that, well, wearing the the, the T-shirt with the slogan or wearing our cross or tattoos or having an app on your phone with, with a reminder that gets sent out to you, love our phones that these things are our ways of doing it 
And yet the reality is that God wants you to know the sweetness of his love. The sweetness of his love that he has given to each and every one of you. Brothers and sisters, I pray that you know that sweetness too. May you know the sweetness of our God who loves you so much that he would go to the cross to pay for the debt of sins no matter what that sin is. May you know the sweetness of our Lord that he loves you. He says, I've forgiven you. Now come here. We're not going to talk about those sins anymore because I've got this. And it's the name of our one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that each of us prays and says, Amen. Amen.